Hey there, misfits. This is Kate. And this is Cassie. Welcome to Horrorwood. fifth attempt now sixth attempt i'm not sure what we're on yeah it feels like seven (laughs) (laughs) we've we've tried to record this episode um a few times today here we are two hours later and i think we're finally gonna be able to get started and mercury is not in retrograde it's not we looked it up just to be sure As you probably heard, that is Cassie in the pod closet. Kale's on a little break. So welcome back, Cassie. Thank you. I'm so excited to be back. Yay. And we're happy to have you. And I promised you last time that I would have you back for a fun one. And this is a pretty fun one, I think. Uh, It's a little different than what we've usually done. Um, But before we get started, I want to just say that we are getting... Uh, listeners sending us their episode suggestions, and I love it. Keep sending us your ideas. If you have a tale of your own, we want to hear it. We're going to read it on an episode. So send us all that. We love it. We love hearing from you. And also, thank you for your reviews. Keep them coming. They help us out so much. We love that. We love our Patreon subscribers who are supporting us every month. They're awesome. I almost made this a Patreon episode, but then I was like, no, I'm going to give it to the masses. <laughs> oh, yeah. I saw that you did an Aaron Carter one, which I'm very interested in checking yes, out. Yes, we did. So as I mentioned before, this episode is a little different. It's not your typical Hollywood true crime, but it is an entertainment industry true crime adjacent if that makes sense great we're gonna go across the pond for this one to (gasps) jelly old england great are you ready for this cassie are you buckled up because this is about to get wild i am so ready great news (laughs) towards the end of march in 1949 chaos descended upon the small otherwise peaceful village of get ready for this one fingering ho which is located in Essex, England. Okay. Yeah, they were not messing around (laughs) with the names of this town. All right. It's on the outskirts of Colchester, which is about two and a half to three hours from London, just to give you an idea of where it is. Okay. Fingering hole? Fingering hoe. Oh, okay. (laughs) Sure. Fingering hoe. Gotta get it right. Fingering (laughs) hoe. Wow. Okay, great. (laughs) Proceed. (laughs) The commotion centered on an abandoned, rundown cottage in the middle of town where a human skeleton had been found on the floor in the bedroom. Swarms of investigators and reporters clamored to the home searching for clues as to who the remains belonged to and what happened to this person. Voldemort. Was it Voldemort? Voldemort did not happen okay. to this person. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but um, I would like for him to make an appearance. <laughs> the biggest question on everyone's mind was, could this be the skeleton of missing actress Ada Constance Kent? Ada Constance Kent, or Connie Kent, as she sometimes went by, was born in Fingering Ho in 1871 to a single mother named Helen. She's not to be confused with another English woman by the name of Constance Kent, who at the age of 16 murdered her three-year-old half-brother. That's not our Connie. Okay. So it sounds like something that could be within this podcast realm also. <laughs> it could, but she wasn't really related to, the, to Hollywood, so I was like, meh guess I'll have to leave you alone. (laughs) Yeah. Different Connie. Okay. Not much is known about the childhood of our Connie, but as far as we do know, she was not a murderer. So that's one thing she's got going for her. According to an 1881 census, Connie Kent, who was nine years old at the time, she would turn 10 later that year, 
was living with her grandmother, a widow named Mary Ann, who had worked as a tailor, although back then she was called a tailoress, and Helen, Connie's 34-year-old single mom who worked as a seamstress. So Connie's mom and grandmother were in the same line of work. They resided on Shrebland Road in Colchester. Ten years later, on the 1891 census, those same three women were still living at the same address in Colchester. So Connie would have been 19 at this time. Okay. And that is the last time Connie Kent appears on any census records. Mm. Her mom and grandmother remain listed on census records until their deaths, but not Connie. It seems that in the early 1890s, when Connie was in her early 20s, she just up and left the area of Colchester. But where did she go, Cassie? I don't know. I, I, it's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to a lot of people. Oh, okay. <laughs> and why wouldn't she have appeared on census records in whatever town she moved to? Because she didn't appear on any records. Do people's names go on census uh, mm -hmm. Censuses? Is that is how do you pluralize? Yeah, censuses, censusai, censai, censuses. I think you're right. Do, do people's names go on censai? <laughs> uh, yeah, they do. Oh, I don't know know that I knew that. Okay, it, here too. Yeah, and it'll oh. say um like their age, their where they live, oh, their name, all of that. Yeah, it's it's kind of invasive. Yeah, I I guess I only thought yeah okay cool I, I mean cool I don't know if it's cool but yeah uh, <laughs> it's cool okay so yeah so they would be tracking her so that's okay that's wild yeah it's widely believed she changed her name and or refused to submit a census return leading to two possible theories of how Ada Constance Kent spent her days. Both of these theories hold value in my opinion. I think at least one, if not both, are true. The first is that Connie Kent. Sorry, I'm. Hold on, I gotta change my seat. Yeah. I'm like twisted. Get comfy. Got my maternity jeans on. <laughs> Never been pregnant, not planning <laughs> to be. Glad I've got them. All right. Amazing. All right. The first theory is that Connie Kent left Colchester for London in the 1890s when she was in her early 20s to pursue a career in the theater. And this would have been just a few short years after the murderer Constance Kent had been released from prison. She was released in 1885. And to avoid any association with a killer, Connie changed her name for the stage to Vera Vershale. I've also heard it pronounced Vershale, but Vershale just sounds more sophisticated. So we're going with Vershale. Vita Vershale. Yeah. Vera. Vera. Oh, Vera. Vershale. Mm -hmm. Vera. <laughs> But I, but I like Vita, too, actually. <laughs> is that even a name? I don't know. <laughs> it is now. Have you seen the Seinfeld episode where Elaine is dating a guy named Joel Rifkin? Like the no. serial killer? Okay. <laughs> it was on, like, reruns the other night, so it's fresh in my brain. So she tries to get him to change his name, and he's not into <laughs> it. And then they go to a Giants game, and he's called over the PA system, and they're like, would Joel Rifkin oh report to the stadium office? And the crowd's kind of freaking out. <laughs> and Elaine just looks around. She's like, He's not the murderer. Oh. <laughs> so this made me think of that. So Connie probably made the right decision to change her name. Reportedly, she was a music hall actress, which is similar to what we think of as vaudeville, and also appeared in film. This was right when silent films began. The first one shown in London was in 1896. So it makes sense that Connie would have traveled to London to pursue her acting career because that's where the action was. I don't think fingering ho had a pop in theater scene, just my guess. <laughs> London had literally hundreds of venues for music halls. And the timeline fits in terms of what was happening with the emergence of film. However, I found several sources stating she's not listed in the British Film Archive records. This doesn't say to me that she didn't appear in a film. She could have been in a film where they have a hundred people on set and they aren't recording everyone's name. It could have been a situation where not everyone who should have gotten credit did. Look at The Wizard of Oz. The actors that played the Munchkins were not listed in the credits despite having lines and solos. And we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s here. So I don't think 
all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. But I just want to mention it because it does come up at a lot of sources that her name isn't credited anywhere in theater or film. Interesting. But we know that she did those things. We think we do. Okay, okay. (laughs) But not only did Connie Kent nor Vera Vershale appear in acting credits, neither name appears on the London census. This isn't (laughs) that strange when you consider that music hall performers often traveled around, likely staying in hotels, so they wouldn't have had a permanent address. And in those cases, the person running the hotel would be the one filling out the census, and they would typically just write unknown woman or unknown man in reference to each person staying there. But the lack of her name on the census feeds into the second theory, that Connie Kent was a suffragette. Suffragettes were known to refuse returning their census forms. They would write on the form, if you don't trust me to vote, you don't trust me to complete a census form. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this does give a reasonable explanation as to why Connie might not appear in the census after she left home. And given that Connie was raised by women, working women, with no men in the house, it does offer support to the theory that she joined the suffragettes. It works with the timeline And I could see her mom and grandmother encouraging her to go out into the world and try to make something of herself, to fight for women's rights and to pursue her dreams. So I can see both of these theories being true. They make sense. And they could also both be, yeah, both be true at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And it also makes sense that when Connie was ready to retire from theater, she would want to return back to her roots. In 1928, when Connie was in her mid to late 50s, she moved back to Fingering Ho. She had her sights set on a small home known as Church Cottage. It was a three-room house with the main living area on the bottom floor and then a bedroom upstairs. And it was right in the center of town, which made it a primo spot. Location, location, location. But the cottage was uninhabitable and in disrepair. And the village of Fingering Ho was like, um, sorry, lady, you can't live there. It needs a lot of work. So she asked the rural district council what repairs would need to be done in order for her to move in. But the council was like, too many. You're not moving in. So Connie decided to take matters into her own hands and thought, well, if by law the village won't allow me to move in, then I guess I'll just have to do it illegally. <laughs> by January of 1929, Connie was chilling in her new home, Church Cottage. (laughs) She just moved in. Yeah, like, what are they going to do? Apparently nothing. They were annoyed, (laughs) but they were like, oh, Connie. For whatever reason, they decided not to fight her on it. They were just like, I guess if she wants to live in a rundown house, so be it. Connie had pretty much everything she could want right outside her front door. Various businesses went into the cottage right next door to hers. At one point, it was a shoe repair shop, then a doctor's office. On the other side of that was the Whalebone Pub. Just a few yards away was a church as well as the village school, and the main road ran right outside her home. Oh, yeah, that's a great location for any town. Yeah, so she's like right in the center of it. But despite being right in the thick of everything, Connie rarely went out. She wasn't much of a people person. Sounds like she kind of hated people, actually. (laughs) Radio 4 from the BBC has a great program called Punt P.I. And in an episode dated August 6, 2016, investigator Steve Punt travels to Fingering Ho to talk to people who actually lived there at the same time as Connie and who knew her. They described her as a recluse, a rather eccentric elderly woman who was hunched over when she walked. She had long, dark hair and always wore long, black, flowing dresses. Her front teeth were protruding out. She was also hard of hearing and used an ear trumpet, which I had to look up. It's basically an old-timey hearing aid, and it is literally like a miniature trumpet that oh, yeah. you held up to your ear. Have you seen those? Oh, yeah. Also, you can do that. Like It's the same um, as like if you put your hand to your ear. It literally makes the sound like funnel into your ear like that's yeah like it's not just like a thing it. that people do for fake you know it it, it works <laughs> it's the same kind of concept just bigger yeah it looks wild it and does. so she's basically just carrying this sucker around 
even though she was, you know, late 50s and the 30, I mean, yeah, in the 1930s, she would have been, you know, going into her 60s. That is not elderly to me. No. But these people are like, she was an eccentric elderly woman. She was hunched over when she walked. So people tended to stay away from her. And according to these witnesses, she was not a nice person. She wasn't friendly to anyone. No one felt like they could approach her. They said she had a bad temper and the school was only a few yards from her front door. So kids would naturally be hanging around her place and she would literally yell at them to get off her lawn. Oh, yeah. that's She was that woman. She invented it, huh? Yeah. She did. <laughs> oh, man. I'm worried that I'm like glimpsing into my future hearing this description. <laughs> Uh-oh. She was not into it, which makes me wonder why she wanted to live in that cottage so badly to begin with, but maybe it was the only empty home in town. I don't know. It's just hard to imagine a woman who seemingly started out as this independent firecracker, fighting for women's rights, performing on stage and screen, could suddenly become this reclusive, impaired woman who barely spoke to anyone. Do we know what happened? Well, it's pretty mysterious still, actually. Okay. She would wait until dark when people in the village were asleep, and that's when she'd go on her walks. Just walking alone in the moonlight. I go walking yeah. after midnight. I you don't that. run into people. I get it. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody. You don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> so she's like, this is great. She was really taking the whole I'm not a people person to the extreme because she <laughs> rarely ventured out during the day. Wow. But one person she did speak to on a regular basis was Alfred Hassler, who ran the, well, the Whalebone Pub. She stopped in there almost daily to buy cigarettes, and the two seemed to be friends, or at least friendly. And it is literally across the street from her cottage. Like, there's her cottage. To the right of it is the building that was a shoe repair shop or a doctor's office, you know, depending on the time. Next to that, the Whalebone Pub. There was another person who we only know as Mrs. Wade. Mrs. Wade used to bring Connie her mail. And every now and then she'd get a piece of mail with a crest on it. And Connie would get really excited because this meant the envelope contained money. There's no explanation of where or who the money was coming from. My guess is it was wages because it does seem like she was still working in London, which I'll talk about that in a second. Every time Connie received an envelope with a crest on it, she would go on a trip, usually to Colchester, where she grew up. Her mother and grandmother had already died at this point. It seems she did have some cousins, though I'm not sure how many were still alive, or even if they were who she was visiting. She did have one friend. In the program I listened to, it's like, she had one friend. Aww. But again, this friend was in a neighboring town, so she sure, didn't yeah. see so her all the time. One friend that she saw probably twice a year because it was the 1800s. She's like, you can stay over there. And literally, this town is like five miles yeah, away. Yeah. Her friend is a woman that we only know as Mrs. Maskell, because apparently in the early 1900s, women were only referred to by their husband's name. Sure. Mrs. Maskell lived in Colchester, so we can assume this is at least one of the people she'd visit there. And when Connie would go to Colchester, she'd stay maybe a few days. But she'd also travel to London from time to time. And each time she went there, she'd stay longer, maybe six weeks at a time. It's believed that perhaps she was returning to the theater on these London trips, which maybe explains the money that she'd receive in the mail from time to time. And when she would go to on one of these trips to either Colchester or London, Mrs. Wade said that she would get really dressed up. She said she would look a treat, which is how I'm going to describe everyone who looks good from now on. I'm going to be like, you look a treat. Uh, yeah, that's. I think that's cute. I really like that. And you know what, Cassie? You look a treat today. Thank you. You too. Thank you. So like that means that no one in the town knew she would leave for like periods of time, which they knew, but they didn't totally know what she was going to do. But the assumption is it was probably something on the theater. Yeah. They assume she was probably going to London, probably to work in the theater, but no one really knew. They just knew she was gone a lot. Because it was before Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she wasn't like snapping selfies. Yeah. 
<laughs> Hashtag stage time. So whenever she went on these trips, she would leave a trunk full of her belongings with Alfred Hassler from the Whalebone Pub. So they were clearly friendly enough that she trusted him with her things. These belongings included some documents of hers that I guess she was worried might get stolen, perhaps, while she was away. We don't know exactly what was in the trunk. On Monday, March 6, 1939, Connie walked into the Whalebone Pub, as she usually did, to buy her cigarettes. Alfred recalled that she looked ill and had a violent cold. She had a horrible cough. and He was like, damn, girl, you sound awful. Here, smoke some cigarettes about it. Mm. So he sells her the cigarettes. And she said, cool, thanks. By the way, I'm headed out of town again. Do you mind watching my trunk of stuff while I'm gone? Alfred said, of course not. I got you. So she left her things there, walked out of the pub. And that's the last time anyone reported seeing her alive ever again. Whoa. Well, here's what I think. All right. Tell me. Tell me. If it's turn of the century time, somebody's coffin, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. I think you nailed it. It's my first thought. Every time. For a while, no one seemed concerned. Because she did go out of town a lot, sometimes for several weeks at a time. And when she was home, she mostly kept to herself. So no one raised an eyebrow when she wasn't spotted around town for days, which turned into weeks, which turned into months. Mm -hmm. Eventually, a friend of Connie's, a man by the name of George Winkle, began to worry. George Winkle was a handyman who lived in a nearby cottage close to Connie, and he would often do odd jobs around her house, one of which was to bring in buckets of water from the nearby pond. He worked for her so often that, according to Mrs. Wade, the woman who would bring in her mail, he actually had a key to her place. So when months went by without her asking him to do any work around the house, he got a little worried, as did Alfred Hassler of the Whalebone Pub. Alfred was still holding on to her trunk of stuff, and this was definitely longer than any other time she'd asked him to keep an eye on her things. Eventually, Alfred contacted Mrs. Maskell, Connie's friend in Colchester, and he asked her if she'd heard from Connie. And she says, no, what's up? And he's like, yeah, she's been gone for a long ass time. So Mrs. Maskell, along with a neighbor, but we don't know who that neighbor is, went to Connie's house to check things out. They walked around the property, they peeked in the windows, they're knocking on the windows, but they didn't go inside. Mrs. Maskell said she knew Connie had a bad temper and was worried she'd get pissed at her if she knew she'd been poking around her house. So she was (laughs) like, I'm just going to look in the window. Everything looks cool. Cool. All right. I'm out. (laughs) So Mrs. Maskell left, not noticing anything out of the ordinary, but also like she didn't really look around. Sometime later, after there was still no word from Connie, Mrs. Maskell goes back to Connie's, this time with her son, and the two were able to get inside the home. They looked around but found no clues as to where Connie might be. Towards the end of 1939 or beginning of 1940, I've seen both, George Winkle, the handyman, noticed that children were playing in and around Connie's house. Remember, she lived right next to the school, and it had become pretty well known at this point that Church Cottage was abandoned. That's been a while then, right? If it's 1940? Yeah. So she disappeared in uh, March of 1939. So we're talking months Oh, okay. Later. Oh, I was thinking it was earlier even when she disappeared. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. But still, like, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when kids see that no one is going in and out of that house, they're like, that is the best place to play hide and seek and to just have fun. But George didn't like the idea of kids invading his employer's home, his friend's (laughs) home. So he contacted the police to ask if they could secure the place so kids couldn't get in there, which is just like, man, come on. (laughs) But I get it. A constable by the name of Bernard Constable went to the cottage to check things out. Together, Constable Constable and George Winkle walked through the house, but nothing seemed disturbed. They peeked in the doorway of the bedroom upstairs. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. They said the bedroom was tidy and there was no sign of Connie. Kids continued to play inside the cottage over the years, so clearly Constable Constable didn't do a great job (laughs) of securing the place. Ethel Donnan, who was the headmistress of the village school, remembered a day in January of 1940 when some students came to her complaining of a terrible smell 
coming from the cottage. So Ethel thought there might be rats in the building. She contacted authorities who went to check it out, but they did not find any vermin, nor did they notice any unusual smells in the home. They were just like, it smells cool to me. It's all good. Then some female students complained that boys were teasing them and telling them not to play in the cottage because Miss Kent was lying dead under the bed. They had seen her hair. Oh, no. But these rumors were never checked out, and the girls were told to, quote, stop being silly. In 1942, so now we're a couple years ahead, George Winkle decides to check out Connie's house again to see if there's anything authorities missed. Which, it's like, why did it take you almost three years to check that out again? But anyway, he claimed to have broken in through the locked front door, but Mrs. Wade had said he had a key, so this didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Also, with the number of kids that were in and out of that house, I can't imagine that any of them bothered to lock the front door. So it was just a weird little detail. Also, that's like a long time for things to have, anything to have happened. Yeah. Once you get past a year, like the evidence is contaminated, you know, like the crime scene is all messed up. Yeah. Not that it's a crime scene, but. Yeah. I was going to say if it was a crime scene, we don't know because clearly nothing was going on that they could find. George said he searched the house from top to bottom, but found nothing out of place. Years go by with no sign of Connie. Then in 1948, large sums of money were mysteriously deposited into her account. The bank tried contacting her several times without success regarding these deposits. There are a number of them. The first was deposited in April of 1948. The last was in September of 1948. Then in 1949, the village of Fingering Ho wanted to enter a best-kept village competition, (laughs) which is maybe the quaintest thing I've ever heard of. That is adorable. By this time, Connie's cottage was in complete disrepair. It was an eyesore, and it was right in the center of town, so you couldn't avoid it. But the town council couldn't demolish it without the owner's permission. However, the owner was still nowhere to be found. According to the book, Foul Deeds and Suspicious Deaths in and Around Colchester, which is a very specific title. Yeah. <laughs> by in Patrick Denny. Yeah. <laughs> Council members <laughs> went to the property yet again, and the back door was partially open, so they had no trouble getting in. Once inside, they found signs that a meal had been prepared many years earlier, but never eaten. A book of Shakespeare's plays was open to Romeo and Juliet next to a paraffin lamp, and there was a pair of slippers by the fireplace, and a coat was hanging on the coat hook. It's unclear if these items were found during any of the earlier searches. It seems like they would have been. Some sources say they were. Some sources make no mention of them whatsoever. So, weird. Yeah, I'm going to need to speak with all of the people that have done all of the searches many times before this, like it's a small house. Can't you turn it upside down once and find everything? It's literally three rooms. Yeah. Like I'm going to need to have a word with constable constable. That's right. That's yes. It was as though Connie had just up and vanished. She was eating dinner, reading some Shakespeare and then poof, she was gone. Concerned. The council members contacted police. They were like, you know, this is above our pay grade. We're just going to pass this on to authorities. One of the first officers to examine the cottage was Police Sergeant T. Waylett, who said the cottage was in a very dilapidated state with everything in disorder. But remember in the earlier searches, they said everything was in order. The rooms were tidy. Just very weird. Hmm. The first level was in shambles. As you can imagine, there's been no upkeep for years and you've got kids in and out of that place all the time. Then Sergeant Waylett made his way upstairs to the small bedroom and made a shocking discovery. No. Yes. Oh my God. On the floor next to the bed, he found a large number of bones, which appeared to contain a human leg bone and a skull. 
local press got wind of the story and news traveled surprisingly fast. It wasn't long before reporters had taken up residence at the whalebone. An official investigation was launched, which it's like, good job. Ten years after a woman has gone missing. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Let's finally start our investigation. And it was led by Detective Superintendent George Totterdale of the Essex Criminal Investigation Division. He, along with Detective Inspector George Kemp of Colchester, were headed over to check out the scene, but by the time they got there, the place was overrun with reporters. But rather than saying, everybody out, this is a crime scene, Detective Tarterdale turned to Detective Kemp and said, let's just leave. We'll just come back after all these people are gone. <laughs> <laughs> Later, he wrote about this incident, stating, the journalists were swarming over the premises. As soon as I arrived, I saw that it was useless starting any serious attempt to investigate with all that crowd around. Um, that's literally your one job. But also, I feel like I've been there. Like, ah, maybe <laughs> there's too many people here. Let's <laughs> let's just go. I thought you were going to be like, I was at a crime scene and I was going to oh, check no. things out. But I was like, so. Cassie, tell me more. No, no, no. <laughs> Once they did begin their investigation of the cottage, they found piles of old letters, numerous photographs of Connie in different costumes, there were fur coats and silk gowns folded up and tucked into chair cushions. Upstairs in the bedroom, the bed was made, but it was covered in debris because the ceiling had collapsed. Next to the bed was a wash basin, so a small sink basically, and on the floor in between the bed and the sink, under a pile of debris, was a complete human skeleton. Whoa. Remnants of rotting clothing were found on the skeleton, but it's unclear if the person had been dressed in these or if the person was lying underneath the clothing. I don't understand how so many people could have looked through that house and not found a skeleton or or carcass or whatever. I mean, the smell alone. Like what? We're talking like if she disappeared in March of 1939 no one ever saw her again so by july we got a big problem in the town yeah right and you would think that the smell Ta in the yeah. middle of summer in Ooh. old timey outskirts of london that's yeah. gonna stink to high heaven it's, and it's not gonna smell great and then we have to wait 10 years especially when rats are just like running rampant Ooh. Ooh, geez. The skull still contained a few tufts of hair, Ugh. which they said matched hair found on a brush on the dressing table. Mm -hmm. This is obviously long before DNA was a thing, though, so they can't scientifically prove that. I think they were just like, huh, that hair looks dark, so it's a match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next to the skeleton was an empty green bottle marked poison. Oh, my God. What? Some sources include the bottle, others do not. So it's unclear if it's really there or if it isn't. The skeleton was taken to London for analysis and examined by pathologist Dr. Francis Camps. He said the skull was still adhered to the neck bones and that the neck had not been broken. However, the spine and ribs had been partially eaten away, presumably by rats. Ugh. And there was arthritis of the spine, which, I mean, she was hunched over. So that made me think maybe yeah, that that's was... part of that. He concluded that the body had been lying on its left side with the right arm slightly raised and dislocated from the shoulder. But he could not determine how this person died or if this was even Connie Kent. The fact that an empty bottle of poison was found next to the remains could indicate a suicide. Yeah. But during the inquest, Dr. Camps testified that there was no evidence of injury to the major bones, neither was there any sign of strangulation or poisoning. Mm. At the coroner's inquest in July of 1949, Dr. Camps laid out all the bones on a table and went through them one by one. And this skull had protruding teeth. And one of the descriptions of Connie was that she had protruding teeth. So mm -hmm. that was enough for the coroner to say, this is Connie Kent. 
and then he signed the death certificate. To be fair, dental work wasn't at its prime in the early 1900s mm-hmm. in England. It wasn't uncommon for people to have protruding teeth, so it seemed like a pretty quick assumption. Yeah, that's fair. For what it's worth, the Scotland Yard forensic report states the skeleton is unlikely that of Ada Constance Kent, oh. as it is too large and likely even that of a man. Can't they like do like how tall they were based on their skeleton or something? But like also, what is too large? Like there yeah. are tall women, you know, so. Yeah, that's I true. I, my skeleton might look like a man's skeleton. I, I don't know how, I was like, what they look what like. Is their, <laughs> I was like, yeah, what are they What are they really going off of there? Reporters went crazy. The story made international headlines, including here in the United States. How does this woman, supposedly once a star of stage and screen, go missing for 10 years with no real investigation? Then suddenly a skeleton turns up and no one had noticed it before? And if she had gone on a trip and returned, why didn't she ever collect her trunk from Alfred at the whalebone? What the hell happened to Connie Kent? Seriously. The opinion of most people around town was that this was all a cover-up, that someone had placed that skeleton there. But this theory doesn't hold up for me. I think someone would have noticed a person hauling a skeleton into the middle of town also, I can't really think of a reason why someone would do that unless they killed her elsewhere so as not to leave any evidence at the cottage. But it's so and weird. And they moved her. To like, yeah, it seems something to cover up when you hear the story and it's like, well, it doesn't seem like anyone was like, there was nothing right. to cover up. Like, if, I, I guess they would have, they were making a more of a show of it actually in the end, which maybe they didn't know if they, if it was a right. cover up. Because it seems like no one was paying attention at all. So Exactly. It just seems far-fetched to me that that would be the case. But a lot of the people in the town believe that's what it was. Mm. There's the possibility that she simply fell and died. Which is really sad to think that she might have been lying there for who knows how long, in pain, unable to move. And no one noticed because she kept to herself. And then she just passed away. Oh my god. Worst nightmare of living alone. (laughs) Yeah, I I think this could very well be what happened. Yeah. Ugh. It's surprising that a more thorough investigation wasn't done early on when kids complained of the smell mm-hmm. and others said they saw her under the bed. Yeah. These kids were telling people what they experienced and no one believed them simply because they were kids. They told the girls they were being silly. But I think it's similar to cases where the town isn't used to this kind of scenario and they don't really know how to handle it. So officers don't necessarily do a great job at getting to the bottom of things. Connie Kent remains a mystery. How she died, even who she was in life. In that program I mentioned earlier from the BBC, they discuss how there are no records of Connie's acting career or that of Vera Vershale and propose a theory that rings pretty true for me. That maybe she wasn't an actress at all, but rather had followed in her mother's and grandmother's footsteps as a seamstress and was a costumer in the theater, which Mm. could explain the fabrics found in her home, the furs, the silks, and the pictures of her in various costumes were perhaps ones that she had designed and made herself. That feels very logical and possible to me. Yeah. In the 1883 Essex Agricultural Show, so Connie would have been about 12 years old, a young Connie Kent won second prize for dressing a doll, which the fact that that was even a category, but again, it was 1883. (laughs) Yeah. But there was a write-up in the Colchester Gazette about her, and it could hint at who she was to become. Hmm. And being that she was born to a single mother, her illegitimacy, if you will, at that time in the late 1800s would have made it difficult for her to get work in a shop because apparently you had to like come from a completely together family and all that bullshit in order to get a job. Yeah, like your last name has to be Taylor for you to be a tailor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is why the theater was likely so appealing because the theater is for all. Mm-hmm. The remains found in the cottage were buried in Cogashell because that is where Helen Kent, Connie's mother, was buried. Someone had to have arranged for that, but who? 
The remains would have been signed over to someone for burial, but that information would be in the coroner's inquest. Also in the coroner's inquest will be a list of the contents found in Connie's trunk that she had left with Alfred at the whalebone. The inquest is kept sealed for 75 years. It's been 74 years. So we only have to wait one more year for some answers. Of what was in her trunk. Of what was in the trunk, of who signed for her remains. Oh, like there is a record of it. We're just not privy to it. Yet. Yeah, but they, yeah, they, okay. won't, they won't reveal it. There is one more mystery, though, that we may never have answers to. And it has to do with handyman George Winkle. Uh-oh. Connie's cottage was demolished in 1954. I'm actually surprised it didn't happen sooner. Because, I mean, that place was a mess. After it was torn down... George could often be seen wandering alone around the rubble. Then in 1955, he went missing. No one saw or heard from him for three weeks. Sadly, he was found hanging in a downstairs back room of his home, just a few yards from where Connie had lived. Hmm. The coroner ruled the death a, quote, suicide while the balance of mind was disturbed. People said that whenever Connie was brought up, George would get very quiet, and many believe he knew more than he let on. And I kind of think he did, too. The whalebone is still there. You can go there and get yourself a drink, get yourself some food. Connie's cottage, of course, is no longer. And that is the case of Ada Constance Kent. There are still no real answers. There's still no real evidence that that skeleton was even hers. So the lesson today is, and this is especially for you, Cassie, make sure your neighbors know. Oh, gosh. They need to know you. You need to talk to them so that if you go missing, they don't take months to look into the situation. No, I, th- that is truly one of the solaces of my life is that I know all my neighbors and they would probably, somebody I would hope would find me in like, you know, a day <laughs> or two. I'm pretty sure someone would find you. Especially with text messaging now and people <laughs> nagging. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people nagging. <laughs> this is a lot to think about. <laughs> it's a lot. It's so much. If someone <laughs> complains of a foul odor and says they saw a dead woman on the floor of the house, the same house that belongs to a woman who's been missing for months or years, maybe investigate it. I don't know. I'm just saying. Going out on a limb. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb. Yeah, exactly. And say, if I'm missing, number one, just come come into my house look look all around yep and if you see my hair sticking out from somewhere <laughs> tell tell somebody until someone believes you just t- tell the next person and the next person do you want them whoever it is that finds you do you want them to check and see that it is you if they see your hair like lift up your head and see is this Cassie they don't have to do that they don't need to traumatize themselves i just need them to <laughs> tell That's so kind an authority of you. And then another one until somebody's like, okay, we're going to come check it out. Yeah. Because also don't touch a dead body because then you're just going to like fuck everything up. So yeah. Yeah. If you do find who you think is Cassie because you see her hair, like don't touch her. Just call somebody. Yeah. Start investigating, doing your own investigation (laughs) and also tell the authorities. Thank you very much. And uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Do you think that skeleton (laughs) is Connie Kent or do you think it's someone else? And do you think George Winkle had something to do with her death because I kind of do, but that's just Yeah, what do you think? I think, okay, he had a key to her place. Why did he tell authorities that he broke in? That that makes no sense to me. Maybe I'm maybe oh, yeah. I'm grasping at straws, but I also think and, and, and it could just be because he missed her and all of that of why he would roam around. Maybe he like had the hots for her and that's why he ended up dying by suicide because he just couldn't live without her. I don't know. I don't know if he's suspicious or if he's just had a broken heart or what it was, but he did wait until 1942 to go back and check the house to see if authorities missed anything, which seems like a long ass time. That was my first red flag is like, what was the day that you decided, you know what? I got to go back there and look around again. Like <laughs> yeah. what, you what, know what, how many days did it take for you to finally like, did you not think about it? And then you did again. And you're like, oh, you know, I've been meaning to get back there. Or were you thinking about it all the time? And then finally got up the courage to do it. It's just, it's a bizarre amount of time in between investigations for, for my taste. 
It's weird <laughs> for my taste personally. <laughs> Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at at Horrorwood Podcast. Yeah, I think I don't I don't need to say the ad. I guess it's redundant. <laughs> um, or you can email us at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. And if you're feeling so inclined, hop on over to Patreon and you can become one of our misfit murderinos at patreon.com slash horrorwood podcast and thank you so much cassie for coming back to the pod closet thank you for having me and uh mm-hmm. i was excited to like you know maybe make a little more jokes this time it was equally as serious but something about it felt a little this one was a fun one yeah yeah i mean somebody died poor connie but well actually a lot of people end up dying most of those people are dead now so i don't know if that makes it bad or not but But maybe they're listening somewhere and being like, fuck, yeah, that was my skeleton. Yeah, those girls are getting to the bottom of it. Exactly. (laughs) All right, bye. Bye.